there's a lot of ways to discover your superpower and one of the best ways is to follow your intuition. If I do X, what's the worst that could happen? And if you can live with whatever the worst that could happen, I do it all the time. Don't go for a quick fix of your business. Be yourself, be authentic. Hang out with the people who are doing the kind of stuff that you want to do. There's endless examples of people who are traveling the world and making their money online and your whole life changes. You're listening to The Remote Revolution Show, the show that brings insights from industry experts across the world of digital business, so you too can take your business online, travel the world, and live with freedom. If you're new to the show, the podcast is produced every Tuesday for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at www.remoterevolutionshow.com. Come back often and feel free to add the show to your favorites in your YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes feeds. If you want to follow us on social media, which you should because we're awesome, join the community by searching for at Remote Fit Pro, where you'll find daily content to help you explore the remote revolution oh yeah and if you want to connect with us individually you can do that too via the links in the show notes now let's get into this week's episode with your hosts james moody and george crawshaw hello and welcome to the remote revolution show today with your host george crawshaw and james moody and we have an incredible guest today a super smart young guy austin distal who's a serial entrepreneur he's a show host and he's head of growth over at a company called Proof. You may have heard of Proof. It's a digital marketing tool, a software that you can use to grow your marketing and increase your conversion rates. Super, super powerful stuff. You might have even seen it on our funnels too. But Austin himself has spoken in the stages around the world on topics of digital advertising strategy, SaaS growth, and marketing automation. And fun fact that Austin was actually nominated for Mr. Atlanta in 2016 and won an award of $10,000. Now in this interview, we talk heavily about uh, Austin's journey uh, through being a, a marketer, through being an entrepreneur, working for himself and transitioning from being self-employed entrepreneur to being an actual leveraged business owner that is able to grow a business and scale it. And, and we talk heavily about using the recurring revenue model and, and creating a subscription-based business and how you know he's helped Proof grow to almost $2 million in recurring revenue per year. And that, that $2 million, almost $2 million, $1.8, comes from their current customers that are already paying them. That's not from new sales. So any new sales that they make is on top of that, which is a super fascinating way to grow your business. And we talk heavily how you can do that in your fitness business, in the fitness industry and different ideas and techniques and, and how to get that going. So we talk from everything from selling lemonade and lava lamps to selling high level digital marketing software to grow your business. So. This interview is super, super interesting. We get real technical about some numbers and how to actually grow your business using a recurring revenue subscription-based uh, model and also how you can really figure out what your customers may want in that kind of model. So really, really interesting stuff today. I hope that you enjoy it. Let's go over and get stuck into today's interview. So thanks for joining us today, Austin. Yeah, man, I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, super, super excited to have you on the show. Austin's a, a bit of a different guest. He's uh, not directly related to the Fit Pro field, but he's a uh, he is a extremely smart guy when it comes to marketing. So let's let's go into that story, Austin. How did you get into digital marketing and and growing online businesses the way that you are today? Yeah, I uh, I would say it's almost in my DNA. Like even as kids, I would you know go and draw up signs to go sell stuff. Like I love painting. I love anything that has to do with selling, but through the marketing of it, right? Like how do I make sure changes of color, you know, get more people to buy my lemonade for my lemonade stand. And, uh, that was at, like as a kid, I was always trying to find ways to make money. And then I started a lawn company when I was like 12. Uh, so I could buy as many lava lamps as I could and uh, grew that collection. Ended up selling the company though uh, when I was 22, so about 10 years later. And then went to college at University of Georgia, which is in Atlanta. And uh, how many of your all's audience, by the way, is international? Is it most, most of the people like you guys are from UK or is it a lot of Americans? There's a big mix, man. Big mix? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of guys are UK that follow us, but a lot of our guests have actually started to be American. Uh, mo most of our guests so far have been American and or foreigners, really. 
See, that's so interesting because like, I don't know what it's like in Europe or, or any other places about building a company from as a kid, but it seemed like in the area that I was in, like every kid had like a small lawn business or a lemonade stand or whatever. And so it was like the casual norm, you know, I wanted to get independent off my mom. And so when I went to college, I was able to, you know, still sustain myself without having to ask my parents for a ton of money. And then I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that that book just changed my life because it told me the cash flow quadrant. It said, Austin, are you a small business owner, self-employed? You know, are you a big business owner or are you an investor? And I realized because my name was on the business and I was doing all the work, I basically created like a self-employed jail cell where if I wanted to leave, I literally couldn't. It was completely dependent on myself. Um, And so that's when I realized I need to get a business that can be independent from me, that it can grow without me and have legs. So uh, that's when I moved all my thoughts to online. How do I understand online marketing, build a software or uh, an online marketing space, uh, some kind of recurring software? Because I knew I need to figure out a way that it could grow exponentially. It wouldn't be growing dependent on my efforts. And uh, so we started off with uh, courses and then from courses went to membership and then from membership to software. Uh, And it's been quite a journey, man. But now it's been probably five years since uh, I've been doing online marketing and uh, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome to hear, man. It's so exciting to hear your your story of lemonade and lava lamps. It actually... (laughs) Reminds me of something that I used to do when I was 13. And I really want to share this story. Now. I don't think I've ever shared it. But when I was 13 years old, I used to work in a pub. Like, I don't know, Austin, you know what pubs are, right? Because you're American. Pubs. It's a bar. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a bar. There's a big difference. Bars are Tell like... Tell me the difference. You, well, bars where you pick up chicks, you only pick up men in pubs. Like, that's the difference. So, <laughs> <laughs> Makes uh, sense. Okay. Here I am at 13 years old. And as all 13-year-olds do, you get the worst jobs going because you don't know anything else so i'm 13 years old and i play guitar and i read in this guitar magazine that guitar strap locks you can use these grolsch bottle tops i don't know if you've ever seen what grolsch is but it's a beer with like a red little rubber ring on it and i was like oh that's interesting i've got those at the pub now i didn't realize that the pub owner had to return the grolsch bottles as part of his contract with grolsch so what I would do is I'd uh, I'd go into the 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 empty stock room where all the all the bottles are to return, and I'd rip off all these red rubber rings. I'd take them home. I'd run a run a big bowl of water and bleach. I'd bleach all these these rubber rings that could be used as guitar strap locks. I got my mum to set me up an eBay account because I was like thirteen or something. Got her to like make PayPal and everything, and uh, started flogging these for for two pounds a piece. And I was I was selling like fifty of them a week. Uh, until the pub found out and uh, that was the end of that job but yeah I used to literally just clean up gross bottle tops get all the, the alcohol smell off them and, and post them out in envelopes to people to sell guitar strap locks on eBay so I love that so ingenuitive <laughs> nice that's amazing <laughs> so yeah when you were sharing your, your story about lava lamps and, the, uh, and lemonade stands I was like this this man is uh, he's on the exact same path as me which is cool <laughs> Dude, that's hilarious. George. We would have been friends as kids. Yeah, we would have. We've been lame kids who like making money together and uh, <laughs> doing fun stuff. George, I need a fun story that you used to make money when you were a kid. Was there anything? <sighs> what did it? I used to sell. Legal. Yeah, I used to, I used to <laughs> legal one. Uh, okay, I've run out. <laughs> no, I used to sell. <laughs> I used to sell snacks. I used to. I used to get big ba- big boxes of crisps, which are chips in the U- U.S. I used to get big boxes of them and I'd uh, I'd sell them for like 100% markup mm. and um yeah they went they went like wildfire I'd always get some weird weird crisps that no one has has ever seen in a shop and uh everyone was like oh my god George has got these weird crisps I'd just be like yeah that's me <laughs> <laughs> they were salt they were called salty dogs they now they're now bigger salty dogs. when they first came out no one knew about them and I was just like this is gold this and then um and then I ran out of money and I couldn't buy any more. So, yeah, that's, that's not you the way to go. You couldn't scale is what the uh, the problem was there. And, I, yeah. and that's what I really I want to ask you, Austin. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, you were the bottleneck. And that's what I want to ask Austin. Obviously, yeah. you, you, for a lot of fit pros out there, will see what you've done as the holy grail. You've gone from time for money 
to creating a course to having a recurring membership or whichever way around it was and then having the thing that is infinitely scalable which is technology as long as your servers and everything can can handle it so can you just talk us through that journey a little bit more what was the you talked about the cash flow quadrant and obviously robert kiyosaki is that how you pronounce his name is that correct so. depends on what accent you use <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that can you just delve a little bit deeper into that and then the mindset shift that you had to go through to make that transition yeah you know here's the here's the funny thing about starting off an entrepreneurship is you're constantly battling getting away from work the thing that's actually paying your bills to do the thing that you want to do and that's a really big struggle. So if you can just get to maybe 3000 to 4000 a month and be able to pay for your bills with your side hustle, all of a sudden now you make the right decisions because you're not coming from a place of scarcity, you're coming from a place of abundance. If you're making all your decisions based on, you know, do I is this going to pay the bills or not? You're probably not making the right decision. Right? Like that's so short-term focused, but if you were thinking the long-term like is this decision going to make me, you know, 100,000 a month in the next 6 months? So the difference comes from the decisions and the way you make decisions is having the right mindset. At the end of the day, most entrepreneurs fail because they don't have the right mindset, so they make the wrong decisions. Uh, if you're right now you know, saying, oh, well, I need to make rent, so I'm going to go and work 30 hours, and even though it's only going to pay me 500 bucks, like, that's not the right thinking because it's coming from a place of scarcity. So the moment you can get out of that, and that's why I say like, go and do a job. That's okay. I used to be frowned. I used to frown upon people who would get a job. Like be like, you're giving up on your dreams. Like you're giving in, you're failing. And it was such like a, uh, almost like anarchy against employment, right? Like I was so hardcore entrepreneur that like it was my identity. And like, if I ever accepted a job, that was the end all be all to my dreams. Like, and that's so not true. I wish I could go back to my old self and say like, Austin, it's means to an end, get there. So you don't make the wrong decisions because so long I was coming from a place where I'm struggling as an entrepreneur and I was just basically doing anything to pay the bills, uh, through side hustles and, you know, selling things on eBay or, you know, doing crap jobs. And as long as I was, the one employing myself, I was okay with that. But long run, if I had just gotten a job that paid some good money and then I could funnel that money into a business that was sustainable, I think I would get to where I am today much quicker. Um, so if you're struggling right now with like, how do I get away from my job? As long as the job is a means to an end to get the side hustle off the ground. And once your side hustle creates twice as much as your full-time job, now it's time to quit it and go ahead and do your own thing. When it just seems nonsense to continue at the job, that's when you should leave it. But make the right decisions based on a long-term horizon and not a short-term horizon. Nice, man. So let's go back to the, your your first real venture of where you were, yeah. were, were trading time for money in the entrepreneurial world. What was that exactly? And what was the what was the growth yeah. pattern that you went through? Yeah, so um, basically through college, I did a little network marketing for like three years and I did well there, but I realized I wasn't selling my own products, I was selling somebody else's products. And so after like, you know, I got the car and helped my friends all get into cars and stuff, like it was like, wow, well, if we had just done this much sales for our own business, like we'd be killing it. So um, that's when I pretty much left that industry and then started uh, a digital marketing agency. So consulting and, and doing done for you services for other people on how to do digital marketing. And that I quickly tripled what I made doing network marketing, but it was for myself. And uh, from that point, it was really just like, I not learning through other people, but I was a middleman. I would basically find uh, a contractor who was just a killer AdWords specialist or something like that, but had no people skills, right? So his weakness is that he doesn't know how to do sales. My weakness is that I actually don't know how to do AdWords, but I know how to sell AdWords, right? So it was a perfect team, right? He would get all these clients and I would basically not have to do much of the work at all. And quickly scaled to like 10 grand a month. And uh, from there, the guy who taught me 
this system on how to do it. I bought an online course on how to do it for a thousand bucks. I spent all my spring break money on this thing. My girlfriend at the time was so mad at me. And, uh, but I, I learned the system. I followed the scripts. I just became a student of the process. And literally within a week, I made over a thousand dollars. So I paid off the course, went to the Bahamas and, uh, within eight months, I was at about 10 grand a month and never ended up having to get a job after college. So that was the first stage of me learning this online marketing world and got a couple clients did well my my contractor did really well for them but obviously my agency got to take the credit for it and uh, from there it was a short while maybe a year after taking the course uh, Dave the guy who taught the course said Austin you have done so well and I, I became like a case study for his company uh, for his course that he offered me to come up to move across the country to be the CMO of his next venture, which was a membership company called the Entrepreneur Alliance. And that's actually how George and I met. Yeah, nice, amazing story. I love it. I love that <clears throat> it's, it's powerful that you, that you were able to leverage like, you know, the skills without having to be the expert yourself, you were able to leverage the skills of somebody else and sell that like, over and over and over again. Um, and so I yeah, guess- and, and I can dive in deeper into that because it was actually a big mindset shift I had. Uh, yeah. In college, I was doing a lot of jobs that were one-off projects. It was, you know, I would sell a branding package or I would sell a website, I would sell videography. And, and I would be doing all the work too. So I would build a website, whatever. And so basically what would happen, I would sell in month one, in month two, I would do all the work for that client. And then in month three, guess what? I'd be broke because in month two, I wasn't selling, I was doing, right? And so I was in my business, I wasn't working on it. And that's a classic quote from Robert Kiyosaki. It's like, you are self-employed if you are working in your business. You are uh, now have a business that works for you if it's working on your business. So I need to find a way I separate myself from the work so I can literally grow the business and not just grow my clients. And it was from that point I need I knew I needed to hire a contractor. That's why I bought the course. Is he taught me how to hire contractors that were actually quality. They got your clients good results, and then also switch over to a product that could that was scalable, right? So if after the end of the project that was done, that was like the end of that income stream. So if I sold a website, it was pretty much a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars in my pocket, and then nothing after that. Whereas AdWords, SEO, or Facebook ads. That was now recurring. It was fifteen hundred bucks a month, and you know they continued to get results. It was an ongoing uh, service, and so now I could stack clients and grow a real book of business, and uh, that was a big mindset shift. So now I think every single time I come into a new venture, does this thing have capability to scale or compound on top of itself, or is it just a lot of one-off projects that are great for cash flow, but awful for long-term liquidity. And that's something that I needed. Uh, it's now a requirement for anything I think about now. Sweet, I just wanna jump in here for the fit pros who are listening and, and, and new to business, you might be thinking, oh, okay, some of this stuff's a little bit over my head. So I'm gonna try and put this into a fitness context. And uh, Austin, correct me if I go a little bit off course here, but the key to running a, a business is to think like a business owner is the first thing. And I, I say this to a lot of fit pros that I meet is start thinking like Richard Branson. Richard Branson doesn't, and I've probably used this before on the show, Richard Branson doesn't drive the trains in the UK, he doesn't fly the planes around the world, he doesn't route the wireless routers to the house, he doesn't do that stuff. He is the visionary who will go and find the people to do the work for him. And that is the difference that you've got to make that shift. So if you are a fitness professional right now, of course, when you start, you're going to learn your trade. And if you're listening to this show, the chances are you already know your trade because you have been working in a gym for maybe anywhere between a couple of months to maybe 10 plus years, maybe even a decade. But if you do want to move online, there's no reason for you to try and be an absolute specialist in every single area. So you don't need to become a specialist of nutrition coaching, of personal training, of physiotherapy, of of even and then even the marketing, the business side of things. You don't need to, to understand how to run Facebook ads or SEO or sales even. It's about finding the right people. So Austin, for you, when you do look to hire people, you look to bring in a team, what are the qualities that you're looking for um, in that particular venture? Yeah, I want them to be extremely passionate about a single trade that they're offering, 
right? So uh, the way I, I determine if they're passionate, like, are they talking about it in casual conversations? So, like, they just bring it up at a bar. It's like when I'm thinking, literally, I'm so obsessed with advertising. Like, if I am at a bar, like, I'll be looking at the branding on a, a freaking beer, right? Like, I, I bring that up in conversation. Like, wow, look how well they did this. Like, what they're trying to come across as. Like, think about that all the time. Uh, if let's say somebody is about SEO, like I want them to always thinking about Google. If they're an accountant, I want them to just be like numbers freaking out. Like they're always thinking about the numbers. Um, a, a good way to see that if they're, if you're just like looking at the hiring is like, what do they talk about publicly on their Facebook or social media? Like, are they blogging about the subject? Are they, you know, uh, for example, like our, our head of HR here now at our company, she's so obsessed with like team culture. She loves culture and like thinking about how do we like make this a fun environment for us. So in general, you want to just find people that are passionate about the one trade that you can't do yourself. Like I can't every day think about how to plan a party for our company or how to do the accounting, you know, and think about the newest tax laws for, you know, that Donald Trump has put in place to make us more tax efficient, whatever. Right. Like I'm not thinking about that stuff every day. So that's not my expertise. Instead of trying to learn that. I need to punt that skill and now hire somebody to come in to, to do that skill for me. And uh, and that even goes down so granular. Like I used to be all of our marketing for a company and now I'm like only half of it. And then I'll be a quarter of it and then I'll be a tenth of it. And eventually like, I'm not going to do any hands on marketing myself. I'm just going to be the orchestrator. And, you know, eventually one day you're just an investor and you have your money work for you. So you literally do not do any work and that's where you want to end up. But let's bring this down to like fit pro level right now. So many of my friends that are fitness professionals are, you know, having one off clients, you know, maybe they'll get them really in shape. And then after that, it's like, okay, great. You've taught me the skill. I can go do this on my own. And there's no recurring there. Right. Uh, or, you know, you're, then tied to each client. So um, you can only have X amount of clients per week. You only have so many hours in a week to be able to train. So now what if you created a course that could do that? Okay, great. You could sell a course. That's $1,000. That's one way to scale, but then you're still limited. If you stopped paying for advertising, what happens to your course? It stops being bought, right? So there's no recurring upon that. So there's just this ladder that you'll come to find. And maybe I can help you guys on this call jump a couple steps ahead, right? Like the natural progression is to go from uh, being back in, at, you're at a gym, you're working for somebody, you have clients. Then it's doing it for yourself. Maybe then you start a studio. So now you hire other people to do your clients for you. And then it's like, okay, now how do I, not have to hire anybody. Now I just have a digital product that can everybody can buy. You know, uh, maybe this is like an online. I tune in to watch me. What was that? Uh, Jillian Michaels? She does that, right? Like you can just watch her programs, and now it's scalable outside of her. So then the next project, because she was selling a course essentially, you bought P90X or something. The next would be how do you make this recurring? How do you get them in a membership around a very specific subject? And my friends and I were talking a couple days ago about how like uh, a vegan personal trainer or like a paleo personal trainer like or like something that's really specific niche, not a blue ocean, but uh, not a red ocean that everybody's trying to do, but like really get down super fine. And now your messaging is on point. That's the thing is if you're trying to market to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. So at the end of the day, find out a very specific niche that you want to own 100% because if you do that, now the people that were your competitors are now your best partners. If you don't do paleo, you do vegan and somebody else does paleo, now when somebody asks about that, you can team up together and share each other's lists. Or you know, if you're only fitness and their nutrition, you can team up together. So that's where if you're trying to be everything to everybody, you're going to lose. You want to really niche down and create some kind of recurring subscription around that. Nice. Nice. I, look, I was literally going to ask you, why is it so important to be super specific? But you answered that. And it's so it's so true. It's so important to not just, I guess, um, generally to be specific, but certainly in fitness, it's really, really important because, you know, you need to find a way to 
to bring your story out or bring your you know that that spark that thing that's about you that you can bring your story mm. out within your business i think that's so so important um and then making that recurring so for you austin you know you've you've done this for a couple of different things now you've got the software and, and, and i know that you did it with the the entrepreneur alliance as well right so mm. what i guess are the keys to make a recurring income based business to work really to start it and to for it to work long term what are the what are the key elements to that first off it all comes down to like knowing your target audience um, I can't overemphasize like how long you should focus on being around your perfect customer because if you get that right, a lot of the business falls into place. Uh, you can learn all the technicals, you can hire out the technicals, but what none of those people can do for you is know your audience. So once you like get around them, hang out with them, take them to dinner, learn about their lives, like what do they do outside of, you know, and start to really build a full scope of who they are, what are their passions, and now you can write great copy, which is you know the, the, the copy on a, on a website or an ad or whatever that speaks to them. It creates their desire. You can create ad images that are really geared towards uh, what their hopes and dreams are and also their fears and what they don't want to happen, right? There's a lot of uh, qualities that come into knowing your perfect audience that are super valuable down the road. So if you can get that clear in the beginning, now you can create a membership that's around it. And, and this doesn't mean it's like a club. There are so many memberships that you can think of, um, whether it's like a subscription to your, you know, a diet, right. Or like you, maybe you, every single month you give them a grocery list of like things to buy. Like that's another kind of membership. It doesn't have to be a Facebook group where they, you know, pay monthly to get your trainings. Like that's what we did, but that's also what our audience wanted, right? But maybe there's other things too that you could do. Like uh, I pay for a membership, 67 bucks a month to get this magazine. And this thing is small, but it's three case studies around um, a specific funnel. So each one of these is a funnel and this is three winning SaaS funnels, and I pay 67 bucks a month for this magazine to be delivered to me. So why is that valuable to me? Because I see three case studies of exactly what I want to do with my business, and I'm willing to pay 67 bucks a month, and I'm sure there are tens of thousands of people that pay that. So it's really specific. They know who I am. I'm like marketing conversion. I'm their perfect audience, and they're, they sold it to me perfectly, and they're giving me a product every month that I want. So... That's what you got to think about. What is a benefit to your perfect audience that needs to be renewed monthly? And fill in that gap. What is something that you can do? Look at other things that are uh, right now one-time membership or one-time products that could be recurring. I, I thought about this, like why is the auto industry, you know, doing one-time payments, right? Like now, I look at uh, oil changes. I have to get that every three months, but why is that not a subscription? Why do I have to be, you know, do this reminded like by, by my gauge? I should just have a membership to my oil change company and go in there every three months to get it for free, for free, but I'm paying it monthly. Another one, I have a, a movie pass. I pay 10 bucks a month to go to any movie theater in the US totally for free, for free. Right. I'm, I think it's for free because I can go to an unlimited amount of movies, but it's only for 10 bucks a month before I maybe go to a movie every three months. And so I think about like, how do I create a one time payment into a recurring product? Because at the end of the day, all of us want consistency in our lives. And so if I can consistently bat out my bills, I can consistently know like I can have unlimited access to this one benefit over and over again. Now that's something worthwhile. It's way more compelling than, you know, to do it one time. So my groceries, they're all now on subscription. I get groceries delivered to me every week and I don't cook. So they're already pre-cooked. They're already healthy. It's called Freshly. So everything in my life now is subscription. I've totally bought it in the subscription economy. If there's an alternative that is a subscription, I will buy that versus the one-time payment. So I have like consistency in my bills. Um, and I think that what it does beyond consistency is it gets the company more aligned with helping you because at the end of the day, your car salesman doesn't want to help you anymore after you paid them. But 
if they now have to continue that relationship month to month, they're committed to making sure you're happy. And that's what I, I think is the biggest benefit here is as somebody selling subscription, I stop thinking about getting the payment first time. I think about lifetime. How can I create a lifetime membership that is always growing? How do I not increase my first time payment, but in my lifetime payment? And that makes, it all comes down to like making a product that helps them, genuinely helps them. That's awesome, man. And I just want to put a plug in for a book that I've read on this. I'm sure you have as well. It's called The Automatic Cus- Customer by John Warrillo. Warrillo? I'm not sure his yeah. surname. Uh, but the, if, you, if you guys listening want some more ideas on how you can actually create subscriptions in your fitness industry, there's loads of examples there. Amazon are obviously one of the great ones to look at. I love looking at Amazon, by the way. Guys, if you want to look at really how to create things on automation, just go and check out Amazon's website and see how many times they try and get you to subscribe to things um, and to really leverage what they've got. It's 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 crazy. And it's upsell after upsell after upsell with them. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty awesome funnel that Amazon have built into their own, own platform. Now, one of the things that you brought up there was that magazine that you subscribe to. And mm-hmm. it's not the magazine itself that I'm particularly interested in, but it's the idea of modeling success. How have you taken that approach and still take that approach today of looking at what other people are doing and putting it into your own business? What do you look for when it's when it comes to finding what's working and bringing it into your business? That's that's both internally, so directly, so your direct competition and external. How do you go about that process and uh, how do you feel about it being important? That would be the big question. Is it important? Yeah. Um, I think it's important for new entrepreneurs to like, understand what it takes to look at models. But once you have a the foundation for like what a great model should be, like what are the fundamentals of that? It's time to put your blinders on and go to work and not look at your competition, not look at anybody else but your customer. There's a few ways to focus on a business. You could either be, you know, competitor focused and look at your competitors all day, every day. You could look at your own business and like try and you know, structure your company and, you know, your team and all that all day, every day, and, you know, be obsessed with your solution. Um, or you could, you know, be investor focused and just try and create a company focused around pleasing the investors. And like, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter your competition or what you create, as long as like your investors are happy. Or the last one that you could do is be customer obsessed, be customer focused. And at the end of the day, if you fall in love with the challenge or the problem, you don't fall in love with the solution, you'll win. Too often, people are getting really tied down to like the way they're going to deliver the problem, deliver the solution. But if you, that could become outdated, competition comes in. But if you're obsessed with the problem itself, the fundamental problem, it's going to open your doors and, and expand your mind to thinking, how are other ways I could solve this problem? Don't get romantic about your business itself. Get romantic about the problem that you're solving for them. And you'll figure out other ways to solve that. Um, And listen to your customers on what they want. Listen to how they want it solved. Um, Now that I've figured out all the the problems that they have, I can figure out my solutions and create a model around that. So there are ways I can look at the model of a monthly magazine or a card that gives me unlimited subscriptions to something. I understand the model. And now how do I deliver that model as a solution for the challenge that my audience is solving? So with magazines, how could you use this model as a subscription to the fitness industry? Well, this could be, uh, you know, new workouts. It could be new nutrition guides, et cetera. Uh, How could you... We already have the gym membership model, right? It's exactly, you know, that. It's not a one-time, hey, I need to get a workout in. That's personal training one time. This is a recurring subscription so I can go and work out whenever I want. There's a lot of ways to do this, but at the end of the day, once you get all of the uh, fundamentals down in entrepreneurship, time to turn the blinders on and don't look at what everybody else is doing because you get in a bubble, Think about how could I do this myself in a new creative way? How do I think is the best way that my audience will perceive it? Nice. And there's one more thing I want to put in from this is if I'm new 
to creating a business right now. We know, we know cash flow is absolutely king at the end of the day. Like yeah. it's incredibly important to have cash coming in the business and building up a subscription. If you haven't necessarily got a, a big audience right now and you're not an authority, might be a challenge. If you're a brand new fit pro, mm-hmm. and I, I, I know you're not in the fitness industry, but if you're a brand new fit pro right now who wants to move online, would you be focusing on creating a subscription at let's say, I don't know, 50, 60 bucks a month? Or would you start with high ticket to get cash flow in the door? Because that's something that we see all the time is the battle against high ticket versus membership sites. Yeah, no, I get that. Uh, We did start with high ticket. I would actually recommend those starting with like high ticket recurring. So, but it would be like a really hands-on done for you service. So uh, for me, for example, it was like digital marketing, hands-on, like I do it for you. I really understand the problems of those people. And then we sold courses on digital marketing But that, it was great. We made a million dollars in a year, except at the end of the year, we had nothing planned out for the rest of the year, unless we wanted to spend a lot more money. Um, And so with the recurring, it's like, I I think that if we even decided, and we won't, but if we decided like not to spend any more money on our company and just kind of dip out, I think that within five years, our last customer would stop paying us. That's how long we continue recurring. And so that's pretty amazing if you really think about like the lifetime acquisition of somebody. Uh, we, we ultimately spend one fourth of the lifetime value to acquire somebody. So if you wanna think about that equation, it'd be really simple. If I spend, if, let's say somebody's willing to pay me 500 bucks lifetime, I'll spend 125 bucks to get them in ads. Really simple. As, uh, as long as I know I'm acquiring new customers in advertising for less than 125 bucks, then my business is set. I put $1 in, I get $5 out, $4 out, $3 out, whatever your equation is. Um, and you have to figure that out. You know, you just have to know the data. Um, can't know it in the beginning. You just got to do a lot of experiments. Uh, but over deliver, always like promise high, deliver higher. And um, at the end of the day, when you come down to what your audience wants. Is it a one time huge payment or is it like you can bring that down and be with them for a longer period? And we said, why don't we stop selling our course for a thousand dollars and do it for 30 bucks a month? And it seemed like we were able to scale a lot faster that way. Um, And it was more viral in itself too, because you're doing a really good job by your customer. You're asking for less money, but delivering value over a longer period of time. So with that, with, with that model that you've got right now, there's obviously a, a mindset shift. And again, I know we've spoke about mindset at the start of this, but a lot of fit pros might not understand what lifetime value actually is and the importance of calculating it. So is it possible if we could just delve a little bit deeper into that and why playing the long game that you've already touched on right at the start, you know, doing things for the right reason is the only way really. Um, so yeah, if we can cover what lifetime value is, and why it's important to to get an understanding, especially when it comes to ad spend and increasing ad prices and all of that stuff. Yeah, uh, lifetime value is just like how much they're gonna pay you over the course that they're in your business. So this is not only your flagship product, but also all the up, all the upsells that you have as well and any done for you services and any, you know, uh, even downsells as well. So let's say like they don't take your product or they try and leave, you can downsell them and it's, I noticed that audible.com owned by Amazon does this really well. If you try and leave audible, uh, instead of paying 15 bucks a month, they'll offer you three months for $7 a month and then it'll go back up. So downsells are also important. Um, but at the end of the day, I want to think about how do I create something that's worthwhile for the long run and not just for the short run. That's what lifetime value is all about. So are you asking like what the equation is or, because that's going to be different for everybody. No, it was just uh, for the guy. For, I know a lot of fit pros won't understand what lifetime value is. They'll see it as client indoor, client outdoor. They'll never have calculated how long a client stay, stays on for them or what products they buy from yeah. them. Um, mm. So so if we can that's actually good. jump like, in. Yeah, count commissions and all that too. Um, on top of like whatever you're selling is commissionable on top of your product as well. Yeah. So let's actually go into the number stuff. I know before we came on air, you you were asking, should we crunch numbers? Should we get into the more technical stuff? But I honestly believe it's one of the biggest mistakes I made when I first started my business was not actually looking at the numbers and just being like, oh, cool. I'm going to buy this new thing over here and this thing over here. And oh, there's money coming in. There's money coming out. As a first time entrepreneur or as someone who's starting their online business and, and gets 
that shiny object syndrome where they want to buy every new piece of software. By the way, guys, buy proof. It is awesome. <laughs> where they want to buy every new shiny piece of software and everything. How important is it for these guys to track their numbers, to track their, their lifetime value, and how do they go about doing it in a simple way that doesn't cause them overwhelm? Yeah, let's bring this back home to the the very first thing I brought up was scarcity and like not making the right decisions based on, you know, the unknown because you don't know where your money is going to come from next month. So you got to make the bills this month. That's the same thing that's going to happen when you're doing advertising for your company. If you don't know the lifetime value and your cost per acquisition, then you're going to be really scared to scale. So if you get clear on that, how many times has each person paid you and, you know, Try and even that out. What's the average of all of them? Uh, and you'll want to put that as like a timeline. So if somebody is just coming in at month one, and then you've also had somebody that's like been like five years with you, you know, average it all out, and you'll figure out what the lifetime value is. Now spend one fourth of that to acquire somebody. Advertising doesn't matter if it's Facebook ads, Google AdWords. It doesn't matter if it's commission for a sales guy. But like, be willing to spend money to to buy customers. Um, think about if you were shopping at a store. And you could just, you know, go and put a customer into your basket, go out to the checkout. How much would you pay for somebody to pay you? And so, for example, like a website, if somebody was going to pay me, you know, a thousand dollars, I'll spend 250 bucks if I get a thousand dollars at the end of it. So think about whatever that is for your all's business. Uh, You know, if you're doing uh, a series of different personal training and then you have on top of that, you know, uh, nutrition uh, guides or products on top of that, add all of them together and that's your lifetime value. Spend one fourth of what it acquires to get all of that money. So here's the thing that I think a lot of fit pros will think about right now is they'll be like, okay, what, what, at what point do I say enough's enough? And what I mean by that is you might find in your business it takes an average of 30 days to get someone to be a paying customer. Uh, it's going to vary in everyone's business from, sure. from what it is. But how does that then factor into the equation? Because I could be here spending money on ads, retargeting ads, mm. doing all of this stuff, and I'm just like, mm. well, at what point does this actually become a customer? How how do I factor that into this equation as well? Yeah, try and make it predictable. Uh, like for us, it's a seven. Uh, it was a seven-day trial for our membership. Uh, now it's a 14-day trial for our software. At the end of the 14 days, they get paid number one. And then for, uh, 30 days after that, we get payment number two. So if we add it all together, that's 14-day trial plus the 30 days. That's 45 days, essentially, for me to make my money. Um, so here's how I think about it. That's a credit card payment. And you can scale literally if, as long as you know your numbers because you can scale really bad if you don't know your numbers. But if I can get enough revenue to pay off the credit card bill that I use for the advertising within 45 days because I've gotten two payments of, let's just call it $100 each, I can spend up to $200 and make that money back before the credit card bill is due. And that's how we scaled to our like, probably first hundred thousand a month. Um, and now profits from that are coming back in and, you know, we're able to rebuy advertising with, you know, the six month payment. But essentially, if you can s- figure out what is my earnings per uh, acquisition, you know, earnings per customer within 37 days, if you're a seven day trial. Or, and then bring that down to like how many, uh, how many leads does it take to get a customer? You can divide that now to figure out what's my earnings per lead within 37 days. As long as you're willing to spend less than that to get them, less than the earnings per lead, now you're ready to scale. If you get eight earnings, $8 in earnings for spending $4 37 days before, now you've just doubled your money in 37 days. Makes it sound so, so simple. But there is one key to all of this, guys, who are listening, and that is please test your product and get validation in your product before you start to, to do anything. We're not endorsing getting loans and credit cards or anything like that. It's just that is the mindset shift that you go through to scale is understanding that you have a product that works and you know your numbers and you can just keep repeating that time and time again. So make sure you test first, which, which, I, which I guess is a good thing to bring up as well. How did you guys go about testing and bringing in so-called founding members or beta testers on anything that you've done, whether that's Entrepreneur Alliance, whether it's Proof, mm-hmm. whether it's whatever you guys have done. Um, how did you go about getting those initial members without necessarily throwing tons of money into ad spend with a complete gamble if it's going to come back or not? 
Yeah. Uh, create some kind of, yeah, a beta product that is, you know, represents what it could be one day and say like, hey, do you want to buy this thing? So uh, in, in the software world, what we would do is get a, an iPad, put a keynote on it and like attach all the little buttons. Like I would draw it out exactly how I would want my software to look. And I give them the iPad and I say, you know, hey, this is going to solve a problem. Could you use it for a second? And, you know, if it did this, would you buy this? And if they say yes, be like, great, I'll give you, you know, uh, 80% off if you buy a year right now. And then you just do that enough times, get market validation. And once you have enough people that say yes to this, I would probably say like, if you get 50 people that say a renowning yes, not just like, oh yeah, sure, I'd buy that. I want them to say like, hell yes, I want this. That's when you can now actually go and build out the whole product. We did this with Proof. So we had the Entrepreneur Alliance and basically it was a membership for digital marketers to learn how to do better advertising and, and convert in their funnels. Uh, we now made a product that we saw online on booking.com and Airbnb and Expedia that said 20 people just booked this hotel room eight minutes ago. And we're like, holy crap, we want this for our business. And we looked in the market and we couldn't find anybody that had done this. So we're like, okay, I guess we'll build it ourselves. What ended up happening, literally our conversion rate on our funnel literally doubled. And we're like, holy crap, is this just because of us? Like, do we make this happen? Or, you know, would this work for somebody else? So we let a few members in the Entrepreneur Alliance try it, got a couple case studies, let them try it for free, by the way. They didn't pay for it. We let them try it for free, got those case studies. Like, wow, this is working pretty consistently. Like, this works really well. And so then we collected those case studies and ask a couple of people said, Hey, these case studies are great. Would you pay for to get the same results as them? A couple of people paid up front. And then we did like a, a launch call. We did a webinar for promoted to our entire list, got everybody we could ask friends and family to get there. People that were interested in this subject on the call. And we said, this is the founding members. We're going to do, we're going to open this up to a hundred spots. And if you're willing to pay for a year of our membership up front, then, you know, we'll give you 80% off something crazy, like a huge deal. And, uh, that was the initial funding. We sold out, we probably made like $20,000 in 30 minutes from doing that one call because it was one, we found a great product. Other people had endorsed this product. We had gotten results for other people. And now we're giving them a great deal to get those same results. Something that they know after this call will be 80% more money. So it was a great, it was a great combination there. And, uh, literally within, uh, 30 days after that, after the beta was launched, got to 10,000 a month, uh, in paying users. And then now today, you know, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I love, I love that story. I love the journey of proof. I remember seeing it happen, uh, and, and being like the guy on the sidelines being like, what is this? What's going on here? And, uh, and then when I saw you it message kick me, off, George, and you, yeah. George, George sent me a message being like, James, check out this thing. I'm like, ah, oh, go away, man. Like, oh, I can't tool. <laughs> yeah, we don't need more tools. Like, leave it alone. And then I started seeing it pop up on, I think it was, it may have actually been some of your, your beta guys who it started popping up on. I was on their websites and things like really early doors. And I was like, ooh, this makes me want to, <laughs> this makes me want to download this ebook. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it is crazy. It's been quite the journey. And like, starting off with, you know, our, our community was a lot of digital marketers already. And so it just spread like wildfire in that niche. And now something like 150 million people a month see a proof. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. I <laughs> didn't expect it to go this big, but that's what happens when you find a product market fit, right? Like we started off with knowing our audience and knowing exactly what they wanted. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been able to do all of this. We wouldn't have been able to pre-sell. We wouldn't have been able to get the results. We wouldn't have been able to, to scale it crazy if we didn't get that in the beginning. So like I said, like in the beginning of this call, if you can find out the product market fit early on and be obsessed with your customers, understand that their problem, so for our problem was, in the Entrepreneur Alliance, was like conversion rates. What's a solution that we can do to you know solve that problem? It's a pop-up that says, 20 people just bought this product eight minutes ago. And 
now we have a whole suite of conversion tools. Remember, we didn't fall in love with the solution, proof itself. We're falling in love with the problem, which is conversion rate optimization. And so now we're creating all of these tools that are helping that end goal and using social proof in all unique ways to sell your products so you don't have to sell them, your customers can sell them for you. And now, you know, we have all these things, so it might, our original might not work as well as our, our next one. See, that's the thing is like, that might even become outdated one day, that's okay. That's just one way of doing the solution. It's the problem at the end of the day that we're solving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's quite interesting actually, I remember a guy tried to copy proof uh, fairly early <laughs> days. And I remember Dave talking That's, about this. Uh, a few have like, tried. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, se- I've seen actually uh, several others. But, and it's this, yeah. what they did is they focused on the solution, right? You, you, what, what I really want to hit home here is, is this, this idea about focusing on your customer and figuring out what they need and what their needs are. It's so, so powerful, so important. Um, big lesson that me and James learned as well. We were like, we, we need to do this more, like focusing on our customer. We learned this over the past year, and and it's been so powerful from from doing that. You know, your your decisions just suddenly become better because you're like, how's this really going to help this person? How's this really going to impact this industry? Is it really going to solve this problem? And uh, I think that's just amazing. And, and something funny I just want to mention is every time I go on a website now and I see proof, I lit- I always stop and I watch it. I watch it pop up and I'm like, mm, how much proof this guy's got? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> and it's, part of, it's part of my like routine when I'm checking someone like, someone's stuff out that I'm about to buy. I'm like, how much proof they got? Oh, we've got 30 seconds ago. All right, this is it. This is on. <laughs> it's so I love funny, that, man. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I got a, a message yesterday um, in our support. That, you know, the guy was writing out how he loved proof and he goes, I literally took off my BBB, my Better Business Bureau certificate, because this is way more authentic than a BBB logo. It's like you guys are becoming the verification of trust online. I love that. That's yeah. exactly who we yeah. want to be. Yeah, and, it, and yeah. It's just just to just to interject again is like it all kind of it's so interesting how you told that story of how you um, you know you found the problem. You by focusing on the on the customers, focusing on the people. You found that problem, and then you solved that problem, and then you got social proof for that problem. Uh, you know the solution mm-hmm. that it worked, and then you then proceeded to to show that social proof to more people. More people came on by giving them a good deal, and this is kind of like the launch process that we teach all our guys. And it, and it is like a process. It's like focus on the focus on the people, find the problem solve it get results give people a good deal to get involved and then then you have a foundation something that you can grow only when you've done that with lots of different people which which i think yeah. is and, and so powerful I, I actually have a great story for the fitness pro community maybe i'm not sure how many of your people are yoga instructors but um i had a private dinner uh, at this like affiliate conference maybe I don't know, six months ago. But anyway, this woman had started, she she knew that she wanted to somehow solve yoga studio owners problem with software. They don't know what the problem is yet, but they're gonna figure out whatever a problem is. They started with the customer that they wanna help, not the solution they wanna you know create. So first thing she did was she went and hung out with yoga studio owners for like six months and every day like, figured out what are the daily things that they're coming into struggles with, you know, and what are the, the biggest challenges that they want solving. And it has to be like a high pain need and happen, happen frequency. Uh, so if it's a frequent problem and a high pain point, that's what I want to solve. So how do I find out what that is for yoga studio owners? What she came to find is that she was so attached to her, all these yoga studio owners are so attached to their business that they can never go on vacation. And if they go on vacation, the uh, the people that are in her studio can't get in. They can't get the you know the training that they want, and so that was a high pain point, And it happened often because she wants to be able to leave. She wants to be able to do whatever she wants to do. So, with this problem in mind, she said, "Okay, how am I going to solve that with software as a solution?" Literally on a tablet, created a keynote that showed her. If I created a streaming service for you on vacation, 
can upload the you know at home workout and have all of your yoga studio subscribers on here and they get a free membership with their yoga studio and they can just log on anytime online when you're out of the country or whatever and watch this studio and everybody can do a class together in their living rooms uh would you buy this and she got a huge amount of support around this all of her people that she was like shadowing bought and now it's a pretty big software called namastream and uh, it's a great product. It helps you yoga, yoga studio owners stream to their uh, membership base on you know poses for the day. And I, I think that's an amazing way cool. to solve a problem for your audience that you might already have an audience. How do you help now upsell them from being just in studio to now also being offline as well or online as well? Yeah, and you could do that, guys. Anywhere if you if you're an expert in movement, in mechanics, in strength. Anything like that, if you're a personal trainer, you can take that model and you could make something very, very similar as well. That's the, the beauty of this. Now, there's one thing that, that I really want to touch on. I know we're, uh, we're coming up to the hour mark soon, but the thing I want to touch on is the idea of listening and egos. We've spoken about this ton on this show, mostly by me, but there's one thing that Austin has really hit home today, and, and that for me is dropping your ego and getting to know your customer better because personal trainers, we think that we know everything because we're big and strong and ripped and all of that. But your client isn't big and strong and ripped and all of that because that's why they've come to you. So you've really got to understand their pains, their fears, their hopes, desires, dreams, all of that stuff inside out. And uh, it would be great if you PTs out there set yourself a challenge of actually going to spend some time outside of the gym, um, go to events where these people hang out. So if they've got other... I don't know, a sewing convention, if that's your avatar, whatever it is, you go and hang out with these people and just see how they act on a daily basis. And uh, I, I know it will be true. Austin's already obviously spoke about this, but your business will absolutely thrive because of that because you'll get the right messaging. And with the right messaging, you will create the right product that solves the pain. And of course, as Austin said, like that, that pain will always be there, but the product will always be changing. So don't get attached to your, your perfect solution because it's not perfect. It never will be. Um, but keep focusing on the people and you'll you'll have an awesome business at the end of the day that, that creates more impact in, in your life and in the lives of others. So, yeah, I think that's some really inspiring stuff today, Austin. George, have you got um, anything else to sort of add, add to this? No, I just think it's re- it's been really refreshing to get Austin's perspective on this because, so, like, it's a very common theme like, in all our interviews. We've interviewed some really successful fit pros. We've interviewed some fitness professional coaches, you know, like AJ Rivera and things. And we all, they all kind of say the same thing. You know, you need to focus on the customer and really help them to, to, so you can grow your business. And what you've brought today, Austin, is, is a fresh perspective on that, is, you know, the, the new ideas of, of how to get to know your customer and and then how to then apply that, which I think is super cool. It's, it's been a really unique interview, getting getting to understand these ideas of getting to know your customer by being with them and then creating a recurring membership for them. Super cool, man. Really, really enjoyed it. And you'd be, you'd be a good chat. <laughs> yeah, and I want to end this with just one more piece of advice is you don't need to build the entire thing up front and then sell it, right? Build the smaller version and then iterate on top of that. Take a wedding cake, for example. Let's say you wanna build like the biggest, most amazing wedding cake in the world, and you don't start off with like building the base and then, you know, doing the icing and doing all this, and then coming to find out that people hate chocolate and carrot together, right? Like you thought, oh, this is the thing. Like everybody would want these two things put together and like look how amazing and pretty and, you know, perfect my product is and come to find out nobody wants it. The best way to start is start with a cupcake and then figure out what are the best ingredients for that cupcake. Put a little icing on that, sell the cupcake. If people buy that cupcake, now turn it into a birthday cake and then build it up a little bit bigger. And now people are starting to buy this birthday cake, eventually buy the wedding cake. Because you're gonna come to find along the way that your stove breaks. You're gonna come to find out that, you know, Uh, the presentation that you had wasn't the right presentation to sell the actual cake itself. So as you go along, your whole model is going to change. So don't expect to build the entire thing up front and sell that. 
I want you to sell a very small version of it, iterate on top of it, take advice from your customers, be empathetic to who they are and like not just as a tactic. Don't be don't just try and figure out who they are as a tactic. Try and figure out who they are because you actually want to learn them, you know, who they are, what they believe, what their fears are, what their dreams are. Be empathetic to who they are. Um, understand like it's easy to get off course if, you know, somebody has been overweight their entire lives and now you're trying to solve that. There's something really deep there. It's not an external thing that you can solve. So find out what is going to help them in a small way and then grow up the solution from there. Nice. Nice and perfect little, perfect little ending to that. And me and James are big believers in that, you know, starting with that small piece. And, uh, but to kind of start wrapping things up, Austin, I know that we met, it was about a year ago because it's Chinese New Year now. And I remember I was, I was in the car with my girlfriend on Chinese New Year and I'd, I was like, this guy is so cool. And, uh, <laughs> and we started talking about digital, being digital nomad, traveling, because obviously yeah. that's, that's what we do. Um, and so we always ask our guests this question at the end, and, and that is, what does freedom mean to you? I think uh, it's just possibilities. It's just being able to take opportunities when they come around and not being constrained because of something, a job, money, time, etc. So if I can open up my life to accept any opportunities that I want, at the end of the day, that's what I'll do. So, um, you know, right now I'm getting money out of the way. Then I'll be getting time out of the way. Once I replace my position with, you know, other people smarter than I am, I'll get out of the way of my time. Ultimately, what it comes down to is do you control the more of the who's, what's, when's, where's, and how's you do things in your life. The more of those things you control, the richer you are. It's not always about money. It's about what you control. Nice. Nice. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. This has been super good, man. Any Anything else that you want to add to that, James? Yeah, I'd love for the listeners to get hold of Austin and all the amazing stuff that he sure. does. So we will put the stuff in the show notes, but we have very lazy audience who won't check the show notes. So uh, <laughs> if you could let the guys know how they can connect with you and then we'll wrap this thing up, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. You can just uh, email me at austin at distal.co. Go to my website, distal.co. There's a little form there if you want to uh, have me speak or come on your show. And then I'd be happy to accept your friend on Facebook. Just make sure you send me a message um, because there's too many that are just spam. So send me a message and also add me and I'll be happy to talk. Nice. Nice. And also yeah. buy proof. How do we buy proof? Yes. Just go to useproof.com and uh, yeah, you'll get a 14 day trial. Um, and if you guys have a link or anything, you can just put it in the show notes as well. For sure, or you can, or if anyone's like going through our funnel like right now, then they'll see it. You just need to click the little yeah. blue, little blue text that says "buy proof." There you go. It's all yours. <laughs> yeah. There we go, man. Awesome. Nice. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Austin. Cheers, Austin. Bye, bye. Thanks for listening to the Remote Revolution Show. If you enjoyed the show, please head across to iTunes, YouTube, and our other social media platforms to leave us a quick rating and review. And if you'd like your questions answering, we'd love to hear from you. So please send them into info at remoterevolutionshow.com. And please remember the show is all about growing the remote revolution. So if you wish to join the community and scale your business, then please head over to www.remoterevolutionshow.com or click the link in the show notes to grab our free download. Yes, seriously, don't be lazy. Click the link in the show notes and grab the downloads. And as always, we'll see you next week.